All right, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not in the sports management program, or, or if you are, or if we have not met yet, uh, my name is Scott Rosner. I'm the academic director for the program um, and newly arrived at Columbia. Uh, so uh, it's been a great month or so, so far. And I've uh, met a bunch of you, but looking forward to meeting those of you who I have not met. Um, but thanks, everyone, for coming to the panel tonight. Um, and for those of you watching uh, via live streaming. So the theme of tonight, certainly for the, the first part of our uh, event, uh, is talking about connecting your passion with purpose. Uh, and so we'll talk about that. The second uh, part is going to be focused more on uh, substantively what our different panelists do. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in due course. So I want to introduce um, our conversation, uh, my conversation partner for tonight, uh, John Wertheim. Uh, John is the executive editor at Sports Illustrated, where he's been a writer since uh, 1996, uh, I do believe. Um, he's also uh, not just limited to his phen phenomenal work at Sports Illustrated, uh, you may also uh, have caught his work on the Tennis Channel, uh, where he is a commentator during the Slam events uh, and does uh, some, some fun work there, so not too far removed from a couple weeks down under. Uh, and also, uh, more recently, has joined uh, the cast of, of 60 Minutes in as a correspondent from time to time. Uh, a couple of fantastic pieces. I guess the first one was the Otani piece last year, um, and also one on Chapaquense. Uh, the Brazilian club um, that uh, is a phenomenal story in and of itself, which you may get a question about. Uh, and in addition to that, his work has been anthologized uh, in the Best American Sports Writing, Best American Crime Writing series, author of nine books, uh, including a couple of New York Times bestsellers uh, on a, a range of, of topics. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming John Wertheim. <laughs> so... John, you, you didn't say uh, the top line of my bio. Which is, we're, we're, we're classmates well, we're together. To that. We're, uh, we're, 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 we're getting to that, my friend. Make sure we're so uh, let's priority. take everyone back. August 1994, <laughs> entrance to Tannenbaum Hall at Penn Law School, and you're in line at graduation, or at graduation, at, at registration, I should say, fresh off a year-long stint or so with the Portland Trailblazers. Um, after graduating from Yale, five years after graduating from Bloomington North High School, I believe. Go Cougars. Go Cougars. Um, son of a father who was a distinguished professor of English at Indiana University. And some devilishly handsome, though dare I say her suit classmate, <laughs> strikes up a conversation. And here we are a couple of decades plus later. So if life is all about the journey, we're going to spend some time talking about yours tonight, perhaps your least favorite topic. Right? Used to uh, asking the questions, not answering them, but all good. Well, so you think about, like, talk about pressure. Like, I'm, inter I'm interviewing one of the best interviewers in America right now, someone who's known for making his interview subjects comfortable. So thanks for that. I'm comfortable. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I didn't even have to offer you candy, <laughs> an old, an old <laughs> John Wertheim <laughs> trick, right? Um, but it's about connecting passion with purpose, and it's a heck of a lot better than giving a 30-minute talk, isn't it? Right? So let's, let's get started. So we'll start, I guess, where we should start at the beginning. When did you fall in love with sports? Um, I, I always liked sports. I grew up in the Midwest, and it was sort of the, the lingua franca. I mean, you sort of had to know at a minimum basketball, but, but I loved all sports, and I think – you know, it took me a, a long time to figure out if a career in sports wasn't like I want to be a pro tennis player or I want to be president. Um, you sort of had to figure out if this was something you, you enjoyed, but okay, enough enough fantasy, time to get a real job, or, or if you could make a go of it. So sports were, o were always a passion, and I think, you know, I mean, honestly – we, we went to law school together, and I think I went to law school. I spent a year at the Portland Trailblazers. Like you said, boy, this is kind of fun. And I wasn't, uh, you know, no, no one was buying jets. No one was getting rich. But it was really fun working for, for a team and uh, being around a sports organization. Um, and I think you talked about law school. I think I wasn't 
dying to be a lawyer, but it was, boy, is it time to, like, enough of the sports thing, time, time to grow up and get a big boy job. Well, and, and at what point did you know that you wanted this to be your career path? Was it, a, I mean, it, you know, it, it's first summer, we're, we're both slaving away at law firms, right? Was it that moment? Yeah, I, I worked at a law firm, and, uh, you know, I was paid handsomely and ate fabulous lunches, and I've never been so bored in my life. And, um, you know, it, it didn't necessarily go over so well with uh, the, the parental, you know, it, with <laughs> it, it took, <laughs> took, took mom and dad some, uh, it took them a while. But I just, you know, I well just worked that long. Well, your dad wasn't a sports fan. Not at all. Not I mean at all. Not like, right. didn't know Michael Jordan from Michael Jackson. But, uh, but I was working at this law firm, and again, it was, you know, I got I dressed like this, and it was, you know, you, you, you get a, you know, a fancy desk and you get all sorts of perks and it was miserable. And I just at some point said, like, I cannot do this for the next 40 years. I may not have fabulous lunches and I may not have, you know, town cars picking me up at age 24. But I just I, I need to. And again, it's the p passion is one of these words, especially in sports. I think it gets overused, but there really is uh, some virtue and some some depth there. Yeah, I mean, we talked about passion being the table stakes, right? If you're getting into a program such as a sports management program, that that's the prerequisite. Forget anything else. Um, if you don't have passion, like that's that you're you're done. But it's also it needs to be checked there, right? So, what did you know first? Did you know writing or sports? Um, it, it's a good question. I mean, I, I it took a while to connect the two. But um, I, I always liked it was it was very similar. I mean, I, I always liked sports. I was sort of the sports nerd and went to you know it'd be come home from college on vacation. What would I do? Go watch games. I always liked writing, and again, it was this internal conversation of no no one's a writer. Like at some point, you gotta you, you gotta get a real job. Yeah. And um, after that summer in, in law school, I was lucky enough to sort of combine sports with writing and I think that that was about the time where I said you know what Ma maybe there's a way to actually make this work and do something that ag again I will feel like a prize could come down from the ceiling every time <laughs> you say the word passion but uh, no I mean I I had the experience of working in an office and having a job that I didn't have any passion for and um, I again I just remember I was looking at my and I don't have any of you recovering lawyers or anyone children of lawyers, and ev every six minutes you're supposed to bill, and I just remember spending the whole summer looking at my watch, hoping these six minutes would pass so I'd go on to the next one, and um, I mean, I, I having had the experience, which I, which I don't in, in any way, I mean, I think it was, it was invaluable in retrospect, but having the experience of having a job for which I had no passion, um, I, I think that was a big step in saying, you know, we, we, can, we can make this work, and if you have a job where you're not looking forward to going uh, into the office every day. It doesn't matter how much how much money they're paying you. Yeah, there's no question. We've uh, we've learned that certainly. I think we're the only two people from our class who who do anything from sport w related to sports. Uh, probably say our job satisfaction. Um, I was going to say we over probably indexes um, compared yeah, to our, now our pay under indexes, but that's a uh, you know slightly, but um, but yeah, I mean I, I would say that's about right. So you intern at Sports Illustrated um, the next summer. Right, the summer of yeah, uh, right, after right. our second year, right? So summer of '96, Atlanta Olympics, right? Summer. Yeah, yeah. The the right. I was supposed to sort of do half law, half writing, and do invest. This was a time when uh, I always tell the story. It was, I think, when the sports na now, of course, it's a busy intersection. But this was when sports and sort of justice were just starting to uh, collide, and you had post OJ, post OJ, and Mike Tyson, and uh, Dallas Cowboys, and I, I think Sports Illustrated, hey, this, this, this guy can write a little bit, and he likes sports, and it's a benefit that he knows what an arraignment is, and he might be able to find some legal documents. So it initially started as sort of a hybrid writing legal internship, and then sort of I, I stayed on. I mean, this is a different time in media, and I think, I suspect Later on tonight, we'll be talking about changes in media because I think they really impact sports. But um, Sports Illustrated basically paid for my last year of law school and sort of said if I were willing to commit and, and start working there, which, which I mean, now I can say I would have done it anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> they they basically paid my third year of law school. We we um, we, we don't tend to do that these days. <laughs> Dif different time in uh, in media, but it 
it, it, it all worked out. Well, and, and so, but your third year, so it's an interesting story that in, in which you have a lot of commonalities with, with, with our students. We have a, f a, a fairly decent number of part-time students. So you're in law school full-time. You're working for Sports Illustrated ostensibly full-time. You're, you're I mean, you're, yeah. doing a lot of, you're doing a lot of freelance kind of yeah, right, right. How would you balance the two? How hard was that? Uh, I mean, you know, third year of law school is not as rigorous as, as first year. But, um, no, it was this weird thing where I would leave class and, like, go to Pebble Beach or go uh, – go to whatever, a, a boxing card in, in Las Vegas. And I thought it was, you know, I was 25 or whatever it was. And, uh, again, um, the, the fact that I knew, it, it took a lot of pressure off knowing that this was going to be something where I was going to try, try and make a career of this. But, you know, I, I think it's like anything. You, you learn to bet. This is the, you, you used to hear these, you ever hear these stories about athletes get better grades than the general student body. And I totally believe it because when you have these fixed time commitments, you really learn how to how to structure your time. Yeah, no, it, a, it absolutely. So, but you also, in fairness, it wasn't just Pebble Beach and it wasn't just globe trotting and, and doing things. I mean, you're, you're serious in your craft, uh, but also enjoying the perks of it, right? I, wasn't your first date with your wife a tag along at a Sixers game? There may have been a uh, spare media credential involved. <laughs> <laughs> Statute of limitations just, just, was lapsed just on yeah, that. Just a, <laughs> a, uh, ethic, Sorry, Ellie, if you're watching. Ethical gray area, right there. <laughs> um, so you become known for. So you took the bar, right? So we take the you take the bar exam. That was fun. Um, so you take the bar exam, and a couple of us go play golf. You started work the next day, right? Yeah, I, I took the uh, new, took took the New York and New Jersey bar. I think my membership is like. Ted Williams' head. It's like <laughs> cryogenically uh, frozen somewhere. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I've never, I've never practiced, never practiced law. Yeah. So you be you're starting at Sports Illustrated. You become first known uh, really for writing about tennis, right? Um, sports business, social issues, a little bit of basketball, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think I, I was talking to Joe. I don't know if we're – yeah, I was talking to Joe. And, you know, so, some people, they want to be the baseball guy or the NBA guy. And, uh, you know, this isn't unique to Sports Illustrated. It's not unique to sports. I mean, some people like this is their lane and this is their specialty. And I always thought it would be more fun to sort of bounce around and, and do a little of everything. So I ended up – they needed a tennis writer, and I knew a little bit about tennis. And you got to go to, you know, you got to go to Paris and London. It sounded pretty cool. I realized that tennis is not – the NFL in terms of popularity, but the flip side is everyone's crazy and everyone's accessible, and uh, it's a fun sport to cover. But I always, I always like juggling and doing a little of everything. I couldn't be one of those, and again, this isn't unique to sports, but I, I couldn't be one of these people who only did, you know, the NFL. Right, right. The, 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 the people who are fantastic at their jobs, the Peter, who some of whom are your colleagues, Peter King. Right, those who go deep into a particular sport, the beat writer kind of thing, not not your jam. And I no, and I think you s you see that again. This I don't think this is unique to sports. I mean, I think there's some some lawyers in the law firm. They're they're the bankruptcy guy, and they know everything there is to know about bankruptcy. There are other lawyers and law firms that are a little bit more sort of free flowing, and uh, that's that just my temperament. So, what was your first cover? Sports Illustrated cover. Um, might have been the David Wells perfect game. Oh, oh, I, I was at the athletes out of wedlock. Oh, wow. It was a store investigative piece on athletes and their out of wedlock children. I think the cover read "Where's Daddy." The uh, the, the, the the writer doesn't write the headline. That's oh, one of these yeah. truisms of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that was that was an investigative piece, and that was a piece where actually having uh, some background in, in law helped. Um, I mean, I think. The next week, I don't know, Kerry Wood, or I don't know, David Wells threw a no hitter, and my legal background had sort of zero help. Right. Um, and it's it's been that way ever since. So, but what did that feel like? I mean, I mean, you're on the freaking cover of Sports Illustrated, right? Y you got people calling you from all over, including me, saying that I just opened my mailbox and I almost fell off the front step, right? I mean, what's it feel like? That I mean, you, you take it in stride. You're like, ah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, in, in retrospect, it's pretty cool. I mean, this, this was sort of, uh, I don't want to say, it's a bit of an explosive story, and you weren't sure who was going to react. I mean, it wasn't like, hey, Michael Jordan scored 40 points, and that's the cover, and 
that's cool. This this there was a lot of you know, lawyering and, and discussions with PR and interview requests. It, it was a bit. I mean, it was something I just never done before. Um, so it was a bit of a. Uh, oh, so you know, oh, we went on the Oprah. I think we were uh, we were on Oprah the following week. <laughs> it was it was all a bit much. Um, it also wasn't a triumphant story necessarily. So I, I think that may have tempered. I mean, looking back, it was. You know, I was whatever, 26 years old, and it was pretty cool. So you then branch into books, right? I believe your first book uh, was a poetically titled tome on an up-and-coming tennis star. The book was called Venus Envy. The, the writer doesn't write the headline. Mm. That's the takeaway. So you've since written eight more right, on a wide variety of, of topics, UFC, sports economics, Sports fandom and science, billiards, Indiana basketball, not Indiana University basketball, Indiana basketball, a kid's book, diet fitness, uh, Al Michaels, right, as told to. The, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, uh, we're going we're gonna to exhaust our quotient of passion, but talk about an endeavor where you absolutely – have to like what you're doing. I mean, b book writing in some ways is greatly rewarding. It was always fun to just sort of have a side project where you're waiting for someone to call you back or you want to take a break from writing about the NBA and you write about a pool hustler. But the notion of writing a book about a topic or a person um, for which you don't have passion is just a recipe for disaster. So these were... Um, a lot of times the books stem from stories I had written where, hey, here's here's a story but boy, there's so much more I want to say or so much that ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, it was a way to sort of spin it into a, to a bigger project. But, yeah, book writing is uh, – it's, it, it's rough but it's lonely and it, it's, a, it's a brutal process. And if you like what you're writing about, it's incredibly rewarding. But the, the notion of – Picking any old topic and writing a book is um, a recipe for disaster. So, um, is, is your favorite writing haunt in your neighborhood still your favorite writing haunt in your neighborhood? Um, I mean, I was one of these guys that are really annoying that go to Starbucks and just get the Wi-Fi code and set up shop all day. Uh, I haven't done that in a few years. Now I'm, I'm in the office and, and TV. Um, I I used to uh, <laughs> I used to be that guy who sort of had had the table and he would show up and get a nice coffee and sometimes leave at five o'clock in the afternoon. Now, now I'm uh, much, much more of an office guy. Um, so you mentioned the, the book ideas. Um, does the genesis of the book ideas, so obviously you're getting a lot from kind of cutting room floor stuff, um, but the genesis of story ideas and book ideas, right, do they differ? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes story ideas are obvious, right? You go to the Olympics and the story presents itself. The Eagles win the Super Bowl. Um, but a lot of times I, I find that they're you're, you're always better off if you write a story that you want to write. When you wait wait by the phone to ring and for an editor to call, or, you know, now it's the same thing at uh, at 60 Minutes. I mean, you, you can wait and someone will say, hey, listen, there's a story we should do about, you know, uh, the, the opioid crisis in Ohio. I think you're always much better off from a work quality point of view when you come up with the ideas yourself and you sort of beat the editor to the punch or the producer to the punch and come up with ideas that that motivate and challenge and interest you. So I, I always tried to uh, – I didn't want to be that guy sitting at home and saying – having someone say, hey, go cover NASCAR. I always wanted to have something where, hey, I, I can't cover NASCAR because I'm chasing this story on the pool player. Um, so I – and the sa same thing is true for books. I mean, um, a, lo a bunch of the books I wrote, I wrote a – fictitious book with a col with Jack McCallum, a colleague who's also a friend. Um, col I the collaboratively, I, th I think people think of writing as very isolating, and I think it actually works pretty well, especially with nonfiction when it's collaborative. Yeah, and you've done a few of those, right? I mean, you did the book with Tobias, right? And you've yeah, done right, the book right. with uh, a couple Al, of Al Michaels. I Al mean, Michaels. Um, yeah, it's, again, it's no one's writing a novel. I mean, if you've got to figure out the protagonist and when the action rises, it's probably hard, but if you're you're sitting there and you're telling stories or you're w kicking chapters back and forth. I mean, honestly, some of it's just a function of time. It's it's a lot easier to, uh, from a time perspective, when you have a collaborator. But I also just find it it's makes the process a lot more fun. Um, so 
you've risen. Uh, by the way, before even getting okay. Um, so having kids has informed to a degree one of your books as well, right? Um, the rookie bookie. The yeah, kids I wrote. Bookie. I wrote a. Uh, I, I sort of naively wrote a kids book, thinking my kid. Go, wouldn't it be cool that I, my my son especially, not much of a reader, but maybe if I actually wrote the book. That w that these are the lengths parents go to to uh, get kids to do what they want. Um, the only I, I misjudged publishing schedules. So I, uh, I wrote this book with a friend. We've got, I think, six kids between us. And by the time, you know, you, you, you send it to the publisher and they've got to print it and market it. And by, by the time the book finally came out, my son had sort of outgrown it. I don't this book's lame. It would have been great when he was, you know, nine, but when he's eleven and it comes out, it's it's less fun. But um, yeah, I dabbled in kids' books as well. Um, so you've risen the ranks at SI um, and are now really in a substantial management position, um, as opposed to you know you start, you're a writer, you're you're chasing your passion. Um, so the management piece takes you away from writing uh, as much as you are uh, used to. Uh, certainly on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Do you still enjoy it nonetheless, and how do you still enjoy it nonetheless? Uh, the writing or the no, the management. Like you know, it's your responsibilities have changed. It happens with a lot of us, right? So the reason you know you fall in love with something um, is one thing, and as you rise up the ranks and get more management responsibility, you're doing less of what allowed you to fall in love with it in the first place. So how do you keep? Yeah, it I mean, this is this is the paradox of all. Of I mean, this is like. Um, this is a, this is a universal, right? That you, uh, when I took the management position, I sort of got this guarantee that I would still be able to carve out time for writing. And now it's you know one. I've, I've got my my sixty minute silo and my writing silo and my management silo. And, and luckily, everyone's you know, we we we've, we've all made this work. Um, I mean, I think that's something everyone confronts at some point. That you you love being a trial lawyer. And then suddenly you become managing partner of the law firm, or you know whatever. You, you like doing deals, and suddenly you, you take a management position, um, and it takes you exactly what you said. It, it takes you out of what uh, what your strength and interest was to begin with. At the same time, I, th I think nobody wants to be stuck just doing what they've always done. So I you know I went years and years without ever going to the. I mean, D Dave and I were colleagues. I don't think uh, it's funny. I don't I don't. S I bet I went to the office every other month to pick up uh, my mail and steal some office supplies for the first 10 years I was uh, Sports Illustrated. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a balance. But I, I think that's something that's sort of a, a general caveat of the workplace in general is pe people want to ascend and they want new challenges, but it's a real danger to get so far removed from what you were good at to begin with. So have you learned and had to learn how to be a manager? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it, the, the thing that made it sort of doubly strange was I suddenly was in a position where I was, these were my other writers were my colleagues. They were guys, you know, you'd see them in Milwaukee and get a beer. Or you'd, you know, send, everybody would bitch about the editor on the group text chain. And it, I thought that, I hope you're, we're not You're not, not, you're not on that text chain anymore, are yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you're the subject of yeah, said exactly. text chain. Yeah, exactly. All of a sudden, you're the, you're the jerk who uh, everyone's griping about. You're the one that's got to look through expense reports and find the, uh, the meals at Morton's. And, um... <laughs> It, I think it was a bigger adjustment than I thought. The other thing that was a, a big adjustment was just, w I mean, you said it jokingly about working in the coffee shop, but when you're a writer, he here's the deadline, here's what you got to do, and if you want to go run in Central Park in the middle of the day and stay up late writing, you can do that, and if you want to go to your kids' performances but skip lunch to work, you can do that. When you're in an office job and there's an 11 o'clock meeting and you're not there, there's an empty seat and everybody's saying, where's worth time? It's um, the, the time was probably the biggest adjustment. So uh, you, you alluded to it, and we talked about it a little bit, but you're no longer limited to print, of course. Um, and as the media business has changed, you're now writing specifically for an online audience, tennis mailbag, anyone? Um, tweeting, podcasting, doing very different types of TV work. Right, analysis at slam events is considerably different than correspondent work at 60 Minutes. Um, book writing. You've also written a screen. Didn't you write a screenplay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, of, off a book. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, w w that get made? That didn't get made. Did it? 
uh, in, in, it's, it's a Hollywood story. Right. Okay. Um, there's a ton of travel. You've got two teenagers. How do you balance it all? Um, boy, I well, you know, I mean, I th I think the the one thing about media I find the the, the dirty secret. Media, it's obviously it's, it's the wild west, right? I mean, no no one knows anything, and and everybody's sort of chasing the next next platform. Um, the truth is, as a practitioner, it's actually kind of fun. I mean, I, I always compared it to boxing versus MMA. Like you, I don't know if you guys are. You watch MMA and they're, you know, they're on the ground and then they're up and they're using their legs and they're, the notion of now then watching boxing is just linear punching is seems uh, old, old fashioned at a minimum. I think the same thing is true in media. The notion of just being a radio guy and never dabbling in anything else seems seems absurd right now. Um, it's kind of fun to toggle and, and tack between you know, TV and podcasts and writing digitally, which is very different than writing for print. Um, the flip side is just it's it's sort of chaos in the industry right now. the The travel, the travel is actually not so bad, just because it's generally predictable. My my rule is no, I don't spend weekends on the road except a few times. So if you're gone on a Tuesday night with teenagers, you know it's like going to they they barely know you're missing. Um, when you wake up Saturday morning at the Charlotte Marriott, that's when I get a little that that's when you start. To but um, it's a little like my my this is I mean I think it's more personal than anything but the the predictability like my family knows I know that I've got to go to Australia for the Australian Open the last two weeks of January it's been that way for fifteen years um, I I think it gets problematic when it's hey we need you to go tomorrow there's forest fires in California so I, I try to just manage it so everybody can prepare in advance you still a fan sports fan. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's like Dave and the Eagles. I mean, I think you, you know, working in media in general, um, certainly sports media changes your fan experience. You're, you're not there to root for it. And you sort of, it's, it's not just like you see the, I mean, I, I like sports and I like athletes more now than ever, but it just seems, it seems sort of inappropriate. Um, I still like in, you know, I think, I think most colleagues of mine, you still have one or two teams and you have your boyhood, uh, you know. Lee Jenkins is a colleague of mine who's like crazy about the Chargers. He doesn't cover them. He's, you know, we'll, we'll go to the game uh, with with his kids, and I'm sort of that way about a couple. So Indiana basketball, but um, the notion of like, uh, yeah, no, it's been been rough times. The, uh, but the notion of like going to Madison Square Garden with thunder sticks and a jersey is, um, yeah, I, I was um, my my fandom has diminished. Put it that way. So, but but uh, you know, I frequently said that the worst part of working in sports is seeing how the sausage gets made, right? And I think a lot of our uh, the colleagues would would, would uh, who work in the industry are nodding uh, accordingly, and that can cause you obviously to, to lose your passion. Have you been able to follow your your co-author Al Michaels' advice? Right? Don't get jaded. Don't get jaded. Don't get um, jaded. Yeah, I don't even have to try. I mean, I find that um, sort of the, the athlete's heart is still sort of the, the soul of an athlete is still fascinating to me. There's a lot of uh, – you see the sausage being made in the sense of, you know, you, you see some of the underbelly. But I, I think one reason sports is so fun and so strong this, – this is not a profession that can really be disrupted, right? I mean, you can have – different platforms for broadcast. We can talk about streaming versus TV. But at the end of the day, like Roger Federer is Roger Federer and LeBron James is LeBron James and UFC fighters are UFC fighters. The core product really can't be disrupted. It's still competition. It's still the best. Um, my, my jaded comes from you know, agents who are giving clients bad advice and from publicists who are telling athletes to say false things and being lied to. I mean – but the actual athletes themselves, I, I think I regard as highly now as I ever did. So I'm going to open it up and we'll get to one of your kids here in a second. Uh, I know how much you love Red Sox baseball. Um, so think of your questions uh, now. So quick hits. Who's your favorite athlete to cover and why? Um, I'll, I'll say Roger Federer, who's – as lovely a guy as, as you think he is, and uh, it's just he's never the, the sort of 
giddy, wide-eyed 19-year-old has never, never left him. Mm. And he was the subject of, of one, I mean, of, of a great book that you wrote on strokes, strokes of genius, right? Which was the Nadal uh, match in Wimbledon. Maybe yeah, the right, right. I'll, t- I'll tell you fun. And uh, Federer said, I don't know if I, if I mentioned this to him. Hey, I'm doing a book on this match. He lost the match. Worst, m- worst day of his life. Worst moment of his career. And he basically said, um, I want to be clear that this is your book, not mine. I'm not ready to write a book. And I said, no, no, no. And, and he said, all right, well, as long as we have that, I'll – anything you want. So here's, here's a guy who, A, this probably cut into his ability to write his own book, which he's never done. B, he lost the match, he lost the number one ranking, and he recognized that this was a legitimate moment in sports. And I'll, I'll never forget, he was you know, 25 years old, it was 10 years ago, and he made his father available. He tr- tried to help me find material, and I'm thinking, uh, yeah, that's, it's un- you know better things to do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, um, he's, he's as lovely a guy as he's portrayed as. So, and, and it's obviously been infused throughout the, the conversation, um, and it's my last question before we, before we open it up. So, career advice, life advice for our students. Um, <coughs> Graduation speech time, right? No, I, I think that a lot of the cliches you hear at, at a certain point in your, in your life, you roll your eyes up, but a lot of them, the older you get, you realize that these cliches have merit. Um, you've got to like what you do. I think, I mean, it wasn't intentional, but I think the point you brought up about finding what it is that motivates you, what it is that charges you, don't get stuck in a box. I mean, you don't want to be the the guy working the toll booth when they invent Easy Pass, but the flip side is don't get so far removed from what you're good at that you have a job that doesn't resemble what you got in the industry. And and it's all a balance. what other? Uh, no, I mean, well, I mean so I but it's funny. So, like, ha- have uh, let's go back to the passion as you as you ponder that a, a bit more. But let's go back to the passion point uh, and not losing it as a fan and everything else. But your kids and and your wife as well have a huge rooting interest, right, in the New York Metropolitan, right? Has that? Oh, oh in the uh, in the Mets. Yeah, the Mets, no, it's, it's right? funny. I mean, I'm the one who makes the the li- is living in sports, and I have yeah, they're crazy Mets fans and I'm happy to go along to the game with them and uh, um, yeah I, I think working in working in sports I, I don't say it dulls your fandom it just shifts it and, and changes it and a lot of times you, you root for the story that you love uh, you know the Eagles kicker um, is, is a tennis fan and he's, he's been we've sort of had a text exchange for the past few months so I'm rooting like crazy I'm a huge Jake Elliott fan um, me too I'm not Doing somersaults when the uh, the Eagles win necessarily, but um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I know it's I know it's our theme for the evening, but I, I cannot imagine you spend so much time at work and you spend so much time, sort of mental time, thinking about work. the The notion of going to a job or entering a field that you're not passionate about um, is is really baffling. And the flip side, of course, is that when you do something you like, it never f- it's it's, it's horribly trite but it's really true when you do something you like you don't feel like you're clocking in so yeah all right so let's uh so let's open it up for our students go ahead i don't know if everybody hear that so so the athletic is a new sports site that's uh based solely on subscriptions um, I think we are all – it's funny because, you know, you used to have these, these media rivalries, and uh, I think everyone is rooting for the athletic um, because whether it's print or radio or TV, I think the flaws of the, the ad-based model have, have been exposed. Everyone's rooting for the athletic. I think um, – again, I, I suspect this will come up in the, in the next hour, but – is my son, who's 16, is he going to pay for sports content in place X when he can get it in place A, B, and C um, for free? So I, th- I think the fact I, – I think they really have to distinguish themselves with their content. Um, but I, th- I can tell you that uh, unlike previous years where, you know, Bleacher Report doesn't necessarily want uh, – uh, name your uh, – 
um, you know, they're, they're, they're rival to succeed. I think everyone at, at some level is rooting for the athletic. Who's Bleacher Report's rival? Why am I? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, Barstool, right, exactly. So, good question, though. I mean, a lot of people are f- following this with, uh, with an awful lot of interest. Hi, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences. I'm a recent graduate of the program, and I used to write about covering the women's sports world and specifically women's soccer team for an online publication. And if I hadn't been writing those stories, I don't think they would have been covered. So what role do you think media has in growing women's sports and supporting the growth of women's sports? Um, yeah, it, it's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, e- ESPNW does does a great job. I mean, I think it's it's always going to be a balance between audience and I, mean I think I think there's an obligation panel. I, I think there's sort of a – it's people say to us, they said, how come you devote, you know, 10 pages to the Warriors and you barely cover the WNBA final? And the knee-jerk answer is, well, we're responding to the audience demand. But I think at some level you've got to – the media has to take some account. It's sort of a chicken and egg thing, and at some point the media's got to say, we're the chicken, and we're going to cover this, even if the metrics say that people would rather have a college football story or uh, Lonzo Ball, what's his name, LeVar Ball story, we're going to do what's right. So I, I think that um, you know there, there's a lot of pressure on media right now, but I think with women's sports, at some point you've just got to do the right thing and cover the most worthy stories, even if the audience doesn't necessarily justify it. Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, so I was listening to your story about how you talked about how you uh, were becoming a lawyer and then how you decided, like, I can't do this. Like, and you basically kind of moved in the direction of, all right, I'm going to follow my passion. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone in this room is pretty passionate about sports. Um, my question has to do with why journalism. Um, I've always kind of, in my own personal experience, always thought, like, you know, maybe a career in professional athlete management would be kind of the angle I would go. But at the same time, like, I've always been interested by the idea of uh, sports journalism. I just want to know for you individually, what was it about sports journalism that you were like, this works? Yeah, I, I always liked writing, and I never really thought of myself as a writer. But I always thought, you know, wh- when I did it, I enjoyed it. Again, it never seemed – math homework seemed like homework. Writing an English paper never really seemed all that bad. If I hadn't stumbled upon writing, though, I – interviewed with a NBA agent in Philadelphia. I mean, I wasn't necessarily hell-bent on, uh, on writing. I think it's just what I the, the sort of path I chose, and then I was able to, to keep going. But um, if it weren't for writing, I think I would have found some other way. You know, I work at Nike, or you, you the, the options now are obviously much bigger than they were then, but I, I think I would have figured out some other way to stay in sports. I just, I just liked writing and happened to have been in my early 20s and kind of lucked into this situation. But um, uh, again, I, w- I, w- I wasn't going back to due diligence in a corporate law setting. I think John's being a little bit self-effacing, to say the least, on this. I, you know, So we all got the passion. That's great. But you've got to be great at something. And you've got to have a definable skill set. And, and John, I mean, you're, sc- you're a great writer, right? Um, and that you are. I mean, even the people, other people, who other r- writers at Sports Illustrated are like, Worthon's a great writer, right? Which is, I mean, that speaks volumes. Um, so you've got to be great at something. So whether it's you're great at CRM, you're great at digital, you're great at analytics, um, you know, you're a phenomenal marketer, you're a great strategist, whatever it might be, you've got to have a definable skill set to go along with that passion. And I think, you know, y- y- you certainly, um, you know, luck is the product of, of hard work and, and some design too, right? So the skill set has to be there. Yeah, I, I, I'll have sometimes people will come in and they'll they'll interview or they'll contact me because we know people in common and they'll say, oh, I love sports. So well, everyone loves it. My son loves sports. Do you like writing? Do you want to produce a podcast? Do you want to be a digital producer? I mean, it. Y- you got to have sports and. Um, it also, like, People don't come in great. I mean, you build your skill set. You build your skills, and I see this all the time with, not just with writers, but you know the the woman who produces my podcast has gotten amazingly good at podcasting. She didn't two years ago. She barely knew what a podcast was. So once you get in a position, 
you keep improving. But yeah, like like um, like Professor Rosner says, you you got to sort of have a skill to go with the passion. So you had mentioned that for print and digital, you approach the writing differently, and I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that, and also along with that, the the illustration, the art on the photos, because photos are such a big part of what Bill was able to do. Yeah, it's, I mean, not having a set length, you know, in the print, if you, you write your New York Times, you know, Maureen Dowd writes her column, and it's got to fit in this got to fit in this column, and if it's twice as long, half of it gets cut. In digital, it's it's much different. The, the tone is different. The readership is different. Um, there's some print articles that are then transferred to digital, and they run in the same place twice. But I, I think the relationship with the audience is different. Um, sometimes, you know, a, a print piece, you, you've got more time. A lot of times digital is just quick turnaround. You know, somebody – wins the Australian Open or you know, so Eagles win the Super Bowl and you just feed the beast. Um, the You know what's interesting about the, the photos is honestly I think these, these little devices we all have in our pockets are really changing images and, and photography, not just in sports. Um, I mean it used to be at Sports Illustrated you'd have a huge photo show and the photographer would send his film and you'd go through it and now it's obviously – all digital, and you can have a great. Sure, you guys see that. I don't know the, the Facebook piece. Everybody read the the Wired Facebook piece. Um, the version I saw anyway didn't have a single bit of art. I, mean, I know we, that there was a Zuckerberg cover, but it was a story that ran. I consumed it strictly as text. Um, in a newspaper or magazine, obviously, you wouldn't have that. But again, this is this changing technology is really um, changing images as well as well as words. Can I, can I say real quick, you're lucky to have Scott. Welcome. Take advantage of this guy. Great roster edition, Columbia. So we're going to transition now right into our larger panel. So if I'll, I'll invite the panelists uh, to come up. And, John, thank you again uh, for everything. I th somewhere here we've got a nice parting gift for you um, as well. Thank you. Jersey but you know Cal has a different <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks, but I'm not going to do that. All right, you ready? Yeah, I know. We're, I know. I know. All right, if everyone could uh, could please find their seats. <coughs> All right, so uh, again, uh, for those of you who are coming from class, thank you for, for joining. Um, and want to get into our panel, and I'll start uh, going from, from left to, to right. Uh, so start with, with Dave Minji. Dave is the Managing Director of CSM Advisory Group um, and formerly uh, the uh, co-founder of GlideSlope. Um, leads a team that provides strategic counsel to many of the world's leading brands, looking to leverage sport and entertainment as a business driving tool. Uh, prior to GlideSlope uh, was with Pepsi. Um, right, am I getting this, getting this chronologically right? Um, and prior to Pepsi, uh, Dave was uh, with uh, Johnson & Johnson and led their uh, global marketing group uh, from 2006 to 2009, which is when they were uh, part of the Olympic sponsor portfolio and um, as a top sponsor, had some really, really cool stuff. Uh, which will, uh, which has become incredibly well known within the sports marketing world for how J and J uh, really is a one-shot uh, kind of a Olympic sponsor was involved. So, um, Dave, thank you very much for for joining us today Absolutely. and uh, and taking the time to to do so. Um, by the way, I should mention that Dave is a, a diehard Philadelphia Eagles fan, uh, which you may have heard I've won heard. the Super Bowl yep. uh, yeah. last week. So, uh, anytime we can kind of you know get that out there, just again remind the world. Um, that's a that's a good thing. Native Philadelphian like like myself. Um, second, uh, and and in the middle is is Dana Rosenberg. Um, Dana is managing director in Tenio's consulting division. Her expertise is building brands, customer engagement, loyalty, uh, and partnerships, um, and works again with with a lot of different companies to drive growth through the lens of customers uh, and brands, uh, customer segmentation, focusing on demographics, psychographic data, brand positioning. Um, messaging, go-to-market strategies. Prior to that, uh, she was at Starwood uh, Hotels, leading their global partnership team. Uh, grew, if you've ever checked in, you've got the SPG Rewards Program. Uh, that was really what Dana was, was all about. Uh, managed a global team and did some really, really interesting stuff. Uh, before that, she was at Kraft, uh, which was your first job out of, out of, out of business school, mm -hmm. right? Um, Dana was, I've known Dana for a very long time. She finished her MBA. Uh, at the Wharton School uh, in 2004, and Dana was in the original group, I would say, of, of rock star students, uh, even way back then. And so I kind of knew that she would wind up uh, back in sports uh, at some point, uh, have, having you know been a softball player at Princeton uh, and everything. But so it's great to see uh, her have such gr great career success and, and a 40 under 40 Sports Business Journal nominee uh, as well. Um, so thrilled to have Dana joining us on the panel tonight. Thank you. Um, and then finally, uh, immediately next to me is, uh, is, is, uh, is Ben O'Rue. Um, joined uh, FC Byron in October of 2010 um, as a, an account manager um, for uh, several big partners. You had Allianz. You had some biggies like Allianz, right? Uh, you got Stadium Entitlement. Uh, Polliner, that's beer, beer, right? So that's good. Uh, Siemens. Right, uh, pretty pretty good, uh, amongst others. So uh, has worked on Champions League uh, related projects. Um, it, it doesn't really had a partnership, uh, and then moved to uh, moved to the, the states uh, to to be the, the kind of the guy uh, and help lead the the New York City office for Bayern Munich, uh, which was really the first of the global clubs uh, to come and set up shop. Uh, in New York, which we'll which we'll talk about as well. So, again, thank you very much for for taking the time to 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 join us here. Um, so we'll start with Dave because he's had the longest wait uh, <laughs> of any of us. And and again, the Eagles won the Super Bowl, so um, you know, to the victors <laughs> or the spoils. Um, so, Dave, your career uh, and what you've got, especially at Glide Slope and then the acquisition um, by CSM, 
you made your bones in, in Olympic marketing, right? And in working with, with companies that were uh, deeply engaged in sponsorship and trying to help them figure out uh, their sponsorship strategy. We're obviously in the midst of the Winter Olympics, um, so we'll, hit, we'll cut right to the topical case. Um, what are you finding interesting about the Winter Olympics in, in Pyeongchang thus far? Wow, well, obviously we're just getting underway. Um, but I think from a business and sport perspective, it's interesting to see what a light footprint um, it is. Many of us kind of that work in that channel um, long have been concerned about Pyeongchang and not that it's um, – anything short of a fantastic venue to host the games, but from a marketing standpoint, from a business building standpoint, um, South Korea is not always a, a priority market if you look at some of the, the key sponsors. Um, and uh, we certainly struggled to see some commercial development of that Olympic build. Um, so as we see it now, and even reports from the ground will be heading over in a couple of days, um, a fantastic uh, footprint from games time operations, if you will, um, minus the wind and the cold, of course, but as we always thought, it was going to be a very well-run, very well-built games, but from a commercial standpoint, it's seemingly turning out to be as light as we had predicted. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, it is the starting point of a, of a three-run, um, a three-game run through Asia, which is very important, and I think you'll see a massive uptick as we shift to Tokyo um, in terms of commercial involvement, in terms of uh, consumer awareness, consumer consumption, of course, so kind of playing out as we had predicted so far. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, I mean, and we'll talk more about the, the three straight uh, Asian Asian games uh, and how that's affecting activation now. They have a re relative remote location uh, as affecting activation now and what we can expect uh, going forward as well. Um, Dana, let's talk a little about data, okay? Um, and, you know, obviously we've talked for a long time about finding the, the appropriate and industry-wide ROI measurement uh, tool probably not going to happen, right? I think everyone thinks they've kind of got it figured out, and if they, if they don't do it publicly, they do it more publicly, they know that they, that they really don't. Um, how was SPG able to measure partnerships, and, and, and how did you think about um, how you use them to grow both engagement, to grow membership, and so on and so forth? Great question. From a Starwood perspective, it really was always about how do you differentiate or enhance the customer experience through which you then gather data, which then drove the business results, as well as then further learning. And that really was the, the cycle that we ran. Um, and the way that we did it from an SPG perspective was it's as simple as you had to opt in, mm. right? You had to allow us to, whether it was with Delta and crossover rewards, you had to link your account. So we had a flag on your account and we were able to see what you did before and what you did after. And it was really easy to measure $60 million in 12 months incremental revenue. And then once you do it once and you get everyone believing in you, it's really much easier to go get the capital and the resources to go do it again. And then that's what spurned Emirates and Sun Eastern. With Uber, it was about a little bit of a different audience, right? Someone who's more digital native, tech savvy, into it, but it also was about real time data. So for instance, at one point in time, and this is no longer the case, but if you were an SPG member based in New York and you took an Uber ride in Chicago, we immediately knew that. We could also check our systems to know you didn't have a hotel stay in Chicago we could have actually sent you an offer real time for a hotel stay that night. It's a little too real time, mm -hmm. to be honest, for everyone mm -hmm. to feel comfortable with it. So rather than use it for that, that's still data that then gets pumped into lifecycle marketing, right? So then if we look back and say, hmm, you've gone to Chicago three times a year for the last couple of years, you only have one booked, maybe we're going to put you a Chicago ad. Mm -hmm. So those are the elements of how we brought our partnerships to life through data. Um, and then from an ROI perspective, we were able to <coughs> very specifically understand what those partnerships go from an ROI perspective. Something like our Cubs partnership mm -hmm. or even our Major League Baseball partnership from a Starwood perspective are a much softer ROI. Starwood could measure it through SPG moments, how many points were redeemed, how many eyeballs, how many unique um, bidders 
were on those sorts of things. But again, that's the softer side mm -hmm. of the ROI, and you need both. Mm. So I find it interesting, uh, to stay with you for, for a moment, Dana, that you actually put the restrictor plate to, to uh, in a way on your marketing by not being super aggressive. Like you obviously cost yourself some um, some some hotel nights, right? Over over time by right. not being super aggressive, but also kind of walking that fine line right. and, and respecting the privacy piece. Agreed. This was also um, I'm looking at my notes here. Get all my notes out. Um, <laughs> Mother of three of, of three lovely girls. Um, you can't miss her and things like that. Right. Um, that this was still like three to four years ago, mm. and so it it wasn't as acceptable as something like Hotel Tonight is now, right? Where it is those real time type of hotel stay mm. offers. Um, but for us, it was more about how do we leverage that data and use it holistically. Mm -hmm. uh, became became much more important and. Yeah, there are times we all should do things, but the right thing to do is actually not to do it. Mm. And I would say that this was that w that was one of them. Mm -hmm. So we move to the brand side. So so Bayern Munich is the top club in Germany, five time champions of Europe. Uh, most recently, about five years ago, right? Twenty thirteen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it's more recent at this yeah, point. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So the the Cetus coming up, right? Yep. I think right. Um, Five-time runners-up, one of the biggest football clubs in the world, one of the biggest sports brands in the world, um, and unlike many big clubs, profitable for the past 25 years in a row. I think we can say that. Remarkable. Pretty remarkable, right? Um, very much the exception in, in global football, right? Very German. Uh, very, very German, right? Um, let's talk about FC Bayern's global strategy. Um, and growing beyond just the traditional historic Munich roots uh, and becoming um, a global brand? Yeah. No, sure. I mean, FC Bayern Munich, as you put it, we are the um, most successful club in all of Germany, obviously, and we kind of exhausted all of the, the potentials in Germany over the last couple of decades and profited from the big German economy, and, mm -hmm. and that was all what made us so successful as well is that we still were able to uh, piggyback on the, the big and good German economy. Uh, but at some point, you know, with all the, the craziness in the transfer market and the, the players that we see that are not uh, cheaper, uh, we, we need to find a way how we can still stay competitive uh, in the market mm. and therefore grow our platform and the brand FC Bayern Munich as well. And obviously with with the entire social media coming up, we also at the same point realize that there are huge masses of people interested in FC Bayern Munich uh, all across the world that we want to give a platform as well and want to reach out as well. And so those two efforts came at the same time where we at the one hand opened ourselves to social media and to grow audiences all across the world. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, had to go above and, uh, and beyond in order to grow the platform and make it more possible for our partners all across the world to use the FC Bayern Munich brand, not only in the core market of the uh, uh, Germany, but mm -hmm. also abroad. And that's h how we s said, okay, one, we have to be out there with the full team. We have to go on tours. We have to be uh, in uh, markets with our legends and our youth team. And uh, we even put it away further and said, we physically have to be there on a 365 mm. day basis. And that's where when we opened our office in 2014 here in the United States, had a huge success here over the last four years. And we put a lot of effort in our localization of our uh, strategy I um, in here. And uh, we see the rewards nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a, as a um, result of this success, we also opened the office in Shanghai as well. Right. And uh, nowadays we, we are kind of a role model for most of the European clubs, how you localize your global strategy in key markets. And uh, this is very much due to the great team that we have here in the States and uh, with all the work that we are doing here. Chris, one of my colleagues here in the, in the audience, one, uh, some of you probably know him already, was a huge driver with our media strategy here and a uh, huge factor of for this success actually here in the market and uh, the fans are loving it and that's ha that's uh, that's helping us so so key markets are shanghai new york city um, china and Ch usa 
of uh, right, so it's not yeah. in the USA, right? Mm-hmm. New York um, is a market in itself, right. it's true, but uh, yeah. No, but but as the key, as uh, right, so I guess the question is why New York City, right, or yeah. why Shanghai? No, I mean New York City is pretty easy for. Uh, I mean, uh, our key market is the United States or North America, and uh, so when you want to hit a lot of uh, media companies, uh, franchises, or organizations, or companies in general, then mm-hmm. New York is the, the hub where you should be. And it's still from a time zone perspective, it's still manageable to work with the German office as well. Mm-hmm. You still have an overlap, uh, and that's that's vital to have, actually. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, though, so, n- so New York City, and but you did a deal that was announced t- today, right? I believe it was, yeah. with, with FC Dallas, oh yeah. right, of Major yeah, League Soccer. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, 100%. I mean, we are very proud uh, that uh, we made this announcement uh, actually today, even though we've been working on this for months, really. Um, and actually, the first initial conversation we had with the uh, FC Dallas folks was in 2014 when we opened the office. So mm-hmm. uh, they were the one uh, or, uh, of the only ones that were part of our office opening in 2014. So... Um, no, we, we are looking, in all what we are doing here in the United States, we are looking for the right partners. Mm. Uh, so we've got a great grassroots partnership with our uh, partner, Global Premier Soccer. Uh, we've got wonderful media partnerships uh, with uh, performgoal.com and others. Uh, and we've got also a great partnership with Columbia University, right? And so we were looking... Thank <laughs> <laughs> No, and we were looking for a partner that can help us uh, also in the professional soccer um, here in the United States. And we, we've been, since since opening the office here, we talked to a lot of organizations, also to the MLS. But we also, uh, we always felt we need someone who, uh, who shares the same philosophy with us, mm-hmm. uh, who is interested in youth development uh, much more than anything else, and uh, is running an organization that is uh, very well run and uh, has got uh, deep roots in, in the in the soccer in, in the United States and uh, FC Dallas and the Lama or, or Lama Hunt and uh, yeah. the Hunt family definitely represent that and um, there was a there was a great understanding with uh, with the Hunt family how uh, how we can approach a partnership and uh, we share the same philosophy. And uh, we are, yeah, we are pretty excited about this partnership, and uh, we'll we'll see what uh, comes out of it. Yeah, and, and their youth program, the FC Dallas youth program, is recognized as the top exactly. one in, exactly, in yeah. MLS. That's, I mean it's that's it's one of the biggest reasons why we entered this partnership, actually. So, or one of the main reasons. Actually. Right, and and uh, McKinney. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean McKinney's he went I mean to Schalke. He went to Schalke, yeah. right? But you beat them over the weekend, so it's yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so Dave, let, let's step back. Let's re-enter uh, Olympic world. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious. Um, who's the breakout star of the Olympics thus far? Um, and s- part two of the two-part question, any other must-have athletes at this point? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's early to say. Yeah. I, I think from a U.S. perspective, certainly the run that, that Chloe Kim put down last night was, was short of nothing short of phenomenal, given also on her first run that really she really kind of walked away with it in right. a way. Um, but a lot of interesting stories. I mean, at the very top is, is clearly the unified team from Korea, mm-hmm. um, a great example of, of sport and this social and emotional undercurrent that makes it so powerful for all of us around the world. Um, a great example of, of how uh, the stage of sport can mean so much more than field of play action. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's just interesting stories that always pop up uh, that are fun to watch in, in the Olympic Games. You see, you know, the Ni- Nigerian women bobsledders and, and people like that. So. Um, you know, the great thing about the Olympics is there will be no shortage of, of stories coming <coughs> out of it. Uh, hopefully the majority of them will, will be positive. There's a lot going on in the movement that certainly I think if you have a seat in the IOC or you're on the administrative side of that organization, there's also a lot of challenges for the future. Um, so interesting times with the IOC and the overall Olympic movement. Um, but I would be remiss not to also talk about the incredible growth we're seeing in the Paralympic movement. You know, make no mistake that the Paralympians are, are elite athletes, just like Olympians, um, and phenomenal growth not only in para sports but also in the coverage. Uh, earlier, there was a question about what role does media play in advancing certain agendas, and, and I think that um, it's great to see the evolution of the Paralympic movement as well. And I hope, hopefully, that's a great story coming out of Korea. Yeah, I mean, about we, we, we were talking about the the media coverage of it. Uh, the numbers are astounding. Mm-hmm. I mean. You know, if if you want to give the data points, uh, how much coverage there is of the Paralympic movement, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in this year's game. increasing globally. Um, from NBC's perspective here in the United States, I believe it's going to be 94 hours on, on television, but you know, probably about 250 overall uh, <coughs> in terms of other platforms in the NBC family. But um, I'm also uh, you know, proud to say that there are other countries that, that show more and have shown more mm -hmm. than NBC as well. So it's not just a U.S. thing. I think a, a lot of times when we talk about the Olympics, um, it's, it's very easy to be U.S. centric about it. Um, uh, and, and so thinking about the Olympics and the Paralympics, it's also important from a business standpoint in, in our industry to measure how the movements are also um, registering locally mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. So, so Dana, uh, you're, no, go ahead, please. I was going to say one thing that's actually, I'm going to switch it up for a second. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I was about to switch <laughs> it up too. So you one thing that's also, I've really noticed from a Paralympic movement is I, I don't remember ever seeing so much focus media from an advertiser sponsor perspective in quote unquote traditional Olympics that was Paralympics focused. I mean, mm -hmm. the number of advertisements in media, especially coming out of Toyota, yeah. um, I love it. I am not used to it. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that that translates now into also then people watching it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I think that that's always been, the coverage has been there, but people haven't tuned in and I'm hoping that that coverage that the eyeballs continue with the coverage as well so Dana from the brand side and and Dave alluded to this and the challenges that the IOC is is having um, from as you think about your potential partners right if you're you put yourself in with with SVG put with star whatever the, the, the entity is as you would <laughs> evaluate how would you evaluate a potential top sponsorship with the IOC? Oh, with the IOC. I take it a step back. There are, I always go back to why would I pay, mm. right? Why would I do this partnership, yeah. right? For Major League Baseball, Starwood and specifically Sheridan did that deal because Sheridan was announcing a repositioning of their 2020 plan. It was spring. We knew the tentpole needed to be in October. Mm -hmm. What's tentpole October that resonates with the Sheridan brand? I start with the brand need. Mm. I don't start with the property. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they need to dovetail, and sometimes if you really need to, you can back your way into it. Mm -hmm. But I like starting with what is the brand need or the consumer need, and, and why does it make, se mm -hmm. make sense? Um, so that that's just one example. Mm -hmm. um, Similarly, for Weston with the Pelot with Pel uh, the Peloton partnership, mm -hmm. right? Weston is all about fitness and wellness, and how do you do it on your own time? Mm -hmm. And how do you also bring in technology and innovation? Because from a Starward perspective, we always our brands always wanted to be on the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. And then the brand dictated who we went after, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It is, it does. And and so, uh, but I'll f flip it back to you, Dave. Yeah. Right. So. The brands that are engaging with the Olympic movement, what are they hoping to accomplish? There's a lot of different things you can accomplish, right? But you would engage the IOC if you are trying to? Well, I mean, let's say that, that we hope that answer is, is move bottom line results. Um, from a business standpoint, it's important when you think about the Olympic Games or, or global soccer as well that um, the movement we're seeing in the industry, let's say roughly, I mean, Joe probably knows these numbers better than anyone, but I think it's about, the last count, a uh, $118 billion sports marketing global industry. Uh, of that, roughly $42 billion is spent on sponsorship. But, but here's the interesting thing about someone, a brand that would choose sport, is, is a brand spending north of $15 million annually um, in the space of sponsorship, 92% of them are non-endemics. They are not the Nikes, the Under Armors of the world. So their core business model is not sport. Mm -hmm. And what increasingly we're seeing more of, uh, not only internally as the brands get wiser on how to leverage sport, but we're also seeing greater scrutiny from Wall Street. You do hear these questions come up on quarterly earnings calls now and saying, what's up with this $300 million FIFA deal and why is that a good investment mm -hmm. for you guys? So um, we hope that, that brands that are looking into the Olympic movement are doing it for bottom line reasoning. Um, what's interesting in that process or this increasing evolution is that uh, the IOC is back on their heels more than ever. Uh, you see some major brands leaving, and make no mistake, when someone like Alibaba comes in to the IOC, 
they're not buying a box of assets. They're not getting a <laughs> category. And, and those discussions with Jack Ma and President Bach are, are quite different. They're truly about here's what we want and here's what we hope you understand uh, and can help us build. Um, you know, we, we met with Alibaba a little while ago and, and they were just throwing out these facts and it's, you know, I think more than 220 million people transact on their sites a day, which is really more than, than the adult consumer transaction here in the United States every day online. Um, a brand that has that kind of power and that kind of data um, certainly goes into the IOC relationship with very direct goals in mind. Mm -hmm. And it's changing up the way that boxes of categories are sold. Uh, it's leaving some properties really having to now actually go bolster their internal organizations with people that no longer are salesmen and women, but that are truly purposeful partnership builders. Yeah. <coughs> It's not about signage anymore, right? I would throw my signage away if they let me, yeah. right? It's more, this is Beth's problem, um, <laughs> it, right? It's much more about building that experience, right? We can all go buy something online, cheaper, quicker, everything else. It's more about how do you make someone feel, mm. right? What is that value add that you can't, that, that you can't put into words? And you go back to ROI. That's why Starwood was able to quantify that people would be willing to drive 15 minutes out of their way and spend up to 25% more because of experiences like that through moments, which is why we went sports heavy, entertainment heavy, and what I call passion points, mm -hmm. right? Sports, music, entertainment, fashion, fitness, beauty. What do people care about? What do people want to talk about? How do you want to reward yourself, reward your family, reward your loved ones from a Starwood perspective when you're traveling all the time and you're not always there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's what you care about, it's what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so it's even more important for brands like us to support you guys or the, the partners with those kinds of experiences, moments, content that you can right. share with your customers. And even full though disclosure, we were partners at one point. <laughs> 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 no, but but uh, definitely that that's a request that we are getting nowadays every time from our partners and uh, and even more and everyone wants to have access to this and uh, unique content uh, produced here and obviously it's it's difficult for for a brand like that like us or a platform like us to uh, live up to all those uh, different yeah. unique requests um, and also our fans they've got uh, their own unique requests and we have to cater to this audience as and use our brand or our platform as a, as, a, as a way to engage with our fans ourselves. So th there's, uh, there's always a fine line. Mm -hmm. um, branding content is always, uh, always the, the buzzword. And, and uh, it's, it's we're trying to accommodate that as a, as a brand. And, um, and still there are brands out there that are looking for this signage and, and for brand exposure and mm -hmm. want to introduce the new uh, Audi sedan to, to the masses and, and uh, are using a powerful global brand platform like FC Bayern Munich. They're, they're always both sides of the story, but definitely the unique experiences and the unique access yeah. is uh, becoming more and more important. And uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's a challenge for, for a platform like us, mm -hmm. uh, because we've got only 22 players that mm -hmm. uh, we can right. get uh, give partners access to. Um, and we need this access as well, nowadays more than ever, since we are catering <coughs> to a US audience, to a Shanghai audience, and to an audience all around the world. And Everyone has got their local favorites, and uh, to a Latin American audience nowadays, no, uh, obviously as well, with all of our mm -hmm. our players there. But this is something we all have to struggle and to work with, and uh, something also the players have to understand that they are nowadays even more not only a, uh, an athlete, but be being a professional athlete also means that you have to be, um, yeah, part of the the game, kind of right. And uh, I think the U.S. athletes know that much more than the European athletes mm -hmm. are used to it. So, so, and and the managers, I think, understand it too. So, how yeah. do you how do you convince the manager that of the uh, of the the demands uh, that the players face and that the brand faces, yeah. right? Uh, that might be different from the smaller club that they that they mm. that they came up with. No, I I mean um, part of FC Bayern being profitable for the last twenty five years is also because we were able to. Uh, make our partners happy, right? So well, and in fairness, and uh, so your commercial, I mean, your commercial partners are, l according to, you know, the publications that rank these things and uh, the, the, the Deloitte's of the world, um, the, the largest in the world, right? Yeah. So the, the fourth largest revenue generating club in the world, um, 
but the largest in terms of commercial partners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, that's uh, so important for us because we are not in a heavy TV structured market. Mm -hmm. So we are lacking the TV revenue that other leagues like the UPL or La Liga has. So our, our partners, partner structure, our commercial partnerships are much more important to us than to any other club or around the world. So we have to make them happy. And everyone, every employee, every coach that is coming to FC Bayern Munich knows about this special relationship at FC Bayern Munich and that, that we have to kind of comply to the rules in that sense. So is, is there an intersection between the global strategy and the labor supply market? So if you think about it, do, does having a global labor market impact your product market? Or is it simply opportunistic, right? So if you think about um, Alaba, right, yeah. who's, who's Austrian, yeah. right, um, or Alcantara, um, or uh, Javi Martinez, yeah. right? Bo yeah. Both Spaniards. D yeah. Does that? How does that help you? I mean, if you think about uh, <laughs> Vidal, right? Would be and James yeah. Rodriguez, probably the, the yeah, two that, better. So Chile and Colombia. That's what right? I meant with, with uh, Latin America. Obviously, mm. the 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 partners that want to activate in Colombia would love to have James uh, Rodriguez all around them all mm -hmm. the time. Um, it, it definitely helps us in certain markets, but we would never buy a player just because he's from that or this key market because we because we Dortmund has Dortmund has a pretty good American player yeah pretty that would that would help you in this market right uh, I mean that that's debatable <laughs> uh, yeah definitely he would help us but uh, would wouldn't the Mexican player maybe help us even more uh, I Perhaps. don't know uh, or uh, I think right. I think every um, global soccer star no matter what country he's coming from uh, would help us if it's Neymar, Ronaldo, sure. Messi, but I think we are pretty confident, uh, uh, comfortable with the roster that we have yeah, right now. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> so, uh, well, you, I mean, you're, you're only in, f you're only in first place. Yeah. You're only in first place by what, like 19 points in, uh, in 18 February? Only. 18, right? Yeah. So, um, any, but have you seen any traction in Colombia in any of the markets in which 100%. your players as, as a result of the player? Yeah, 100%, yeah. especially in Colombia. But uh, James Rodriguez is such a phenomenon actually actually that it's yeah. uh, difficult uh, difficult to compare but also in Chile with uh, Arturo Vidal we see um, a huge uh, uptick in, in the numbers uh, but uh, yeah Colombo, uh, Colombia was definitely exceptional yeah for sure. so so Dave w when we th step back and think about um, global sponsorship uh, uh, particularly with respect to mega events so FIFA World Cup um, you know, obviously, the Olympic Games, ma maybe a Cricket World Cup as as well. Um, are you noticing any larger trends surrounding them? Well, I mean, certainly there's the obvious. There's the reduction in footprint. Um, but one of the interesting things that I'm really curious to see if it develops is the elimination of the bid process. Um, in in full disclosure, our chairman at CSM is Sebastian Coe, Lord Coe. Uh, Olympic gold medalist, former member of parliament, head of the London 2012 Games, and is now the head of the IAAF, so the World Track and Field Federation. Um, and increasingly you see gentlemen like Lord Coe talking more about why are we even doing the bid process? Mm -hmm. Why don't we treat it more like a business who is self-selecting a city that they believe is best for their needs at that time? Um, so in, in some ways is the bid process and all the problems that have come along with it self-inflicted. So I think that's a really interesting um, you know, story with that and in, in terms of the globalization. On the consumer side, um, just looking out at your audience, you know, these mega events, do you care? You know, what will make you care? And sort of the disintermediation mm -hmm. of, of, you know, OTT and, and mobile apps and whatnot and, and, you know, beyond kind of the expectations of what the Olympics can be, does it fit into your life? Um, so, you know, those are things we're following. I mean, selfishly for all you guys, I know it's, it's in somewhat, it's a, it's a career fair, and as John said, you know, find work that's meaningful, <coughs> because it really does matter uh, when you're working late or you're flying all around the world or, or just thinking about stressing on the subway about something. But we have about a decade of great opportunity in this country coming up. So, I mean, you even can skip from uh, Rugby Sevens World Cup coming up. but. For the first time ever, we're going to have the three largest mega events that you mentioned, Scott, coming to the United States, and it starts with the World Track and Field Championships coming to Eugene, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we move on to, knock on wood, hopefully a World Cup, as long as we can knock out Morocco, and that, that bid process <coughs> certainly seems hopeful. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the games coming to Los Angeles, the Olympic Games. Uh, there's also some behind-the-scenes talk about um, a winter bid coming right behind that from the United States. So. In some ways, as you guys are entering the workforce here, we have an unprecedented rough decade of opportunity for you to be involved in these mega events. 
So that's just selfishly, as an American, that's something very interesting for us to follow, both personally and, and commercially. Mm. So, and let me follow up on that Olympic-related question, Dana, with you. Um, so, again, playing the hypothetical, you're, you're, you're the brand, you're making the decisions. Um, let's say that you have a relationship right now with USA Gymnastics, right? What do you do? I'm separating mom of three, right. of three girls, and the brand. Um, You're recommending this to the CEO. You're the chief marketing officer. Congratulations, by the way. Um, so there are, two, there are two ways I'm thinking about this, which is why my wheels are spinning, right? Mm -hmm. One, I, my first one is, what is my brand? Who do I stand for? What is my messaging? Things like that, mm -hmm. right? If I am insurance, financial markets, and this might be a totally bad idea. This is all off the cup, cuff of my head, right? Yeah, I, sp I sprung this on her, sure, for sure. We'll talk later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of... Is there any way to spin this to how do you plan for the unexpected, right? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you take bad information, turn it into good? I, and this is such a, a situation where I don't think you can, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that would be one thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, it would depend on who the brand is and could you change based on the messaging, any of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of it is, look, sometimes you just cut bait. Right, and, and you go take that money and you go spend it somewhere else. I saw the same thing about the markets right. today, the financial markets, right? At some point, you just say, okay, we got some good out of this during some years. Let's leave, go reinvest the funds because it's not going to be worth the opportunity, the lost opportunity cost because this is not going away anytime soon, right? right? Because from a um, university perspective, from a state perspective, from – a Crowley Ranch located, this is not ending yet. Yeah. And do you want to continue to be involved with it? I would probably say no. Mm. Um, so that would be my recommendation. If I may ask a question, I mean, the everything horrible and yep. difficultly, uh, really horrible managed as well, but the sport will still be there, right? And there will still be women and kids be passionate about doing gymnastics and if everyone would leave ship, that would be even more horrible to those people that love the sport. If you just try to really focus it on the sport and uh, kind of phase yeah. out <laughs> everything else, if that's possible. And I completely agree, which is why yeah. I tried to lead in with the first part of, yeah. I think it depends on how you can tell the story for your mm -hmm. brand, knowing who your brand is, yeah, right? Sure. So, but I agree with you, right? these girls and women actually need more support now than ever exactly, yeah. probably and you don't want to be someone who leaves so mm -hmm. if you can still get your correct brand messaging across mm -hmm. while doing that and telling that story and yes being part of the team you have to exactly also. you stay but depending on who your brand is mm -hmm. it there there are some brands where actually it would be more detrimental to stay mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, that gives you a little bit of a, a mindset, <laughs> kind of why I sprung the question um, into the, the thought calculus behind uh, behind something like this, right? So we have time for uh, one or two questions, uh, and then they give us the hook. There's a special branch of the Columbia University police, apparently, that come in and, and grab <laughs> you out of here. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's take one or two, uh, and we'll... Uh, thank you so much, firstly, for being here. It's thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I was actually wondering, especially from a brand perspective, uh, you mentioned uh, the United States and, and China as being two big markets. And this is a selfish question because I am Indian. Where does India figure into the equation? That's It's, it's 1.3 billion people, admittedly <laughs> with, without as much as for purchasing power as America or China, but still a sig significant amount of uh, resources there. No, uh, India is definitely a market that we're looking at, but... Uh, you spread thin if you go into every market, really. So uh, we um, we are focusing at the moment on uh, on the U.S. or let's say 
Uh, we actually, from the U.S. office, we also are expanding into the Americas in total. And uh, the office in China was just open in uh, March 2017, so just a year ago. Uh, give them some time to settle in the <laughs> in Chinese market, and then no. We, but we've always had a good relationship with, or, or uh, yeah, a good relationship with the Indian market already because we uh, played a friendly in India in 2010, I believe. Uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, there were always kind of discussions going on if we want to build their football school and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. never really came to life. And then. Uh, at some point we said, okay, let's focus on those two key markets and uh, let's see uh, how the other markets are developing. But India is definitely up there. I mean, with the uh, English uh, Premier League, uh, the, uh, that's really exciting what's happening there. And yeah, it's a developing market that, uh, and yeah, the numbers you, d you put it, it's, it's di uh, difficult to ignore. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Time for one more. Thank you for the great speech. And um, I'll have one question for the media. And um, the Pyeongchang Olympics, I think, is very fun and entertaining. But one question I had was uh, the time schedule of the program. Uh, with my home country in, in Asia, in Tokyo, even though figure skating and skate jumping are very popular, it's um, the it runs from midnight or from like 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Because I think it's very based on American audiences and Chinese audiences. So even though it's um, in Korea, the times the uh, games are played are based on the states, I think. And do you think this will be a trend for the future? Or do you think with the uh, purchasing power shifting over to like Asia or India, it will shift in the future? Or do you have any thoughts on this like time of prep? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question and a very important one. Um, as we all heard in 2008, you know, Michael Phelps did not prefer swimming for a medal, you know, at 8.55 in the morning <laughs> or whatever time that was. Um, and, and, you know, but, but in so many respects, the commercial dollars that are behind these types of events are, are very important for their longevity and the sustainability. I think what we're increasingly seeing, though, is um, other platforms that are available for better viewing time slots for live audiences. Um, the other issue is certainly the IOC uh, has a duty, as they say, to ensure that the games are being enjoyed in, in the right regions in the right way and moved, moved around the world. Um, but it's a very complex problem because it's one of those situations, as you might say, no matter what time it is, it's bad for someone in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, do you go back to where your largest audiences are for the live feed or do you go to where you want your largest audiences to be, something like India, perhaps in the future. It's a, it's a big, complex question. Um, I'm certainly not as qualified as, say, the folks at NBC to respond to that, um, but uh, it is something that we all wrestle with, and, and even on the commercial side, because when do we want our ads, if you will, kind of running at certain periods and, and live versus tape delayed and whatnot? same issues we have with our kickoff times in the Bundesliga as well. So what market do we cater to? Is it the German audience? Is it the American? Is it the Asian audience? And uh, yeah, that's definitely something to figure out. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the early morning kickoff. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep, keep going. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone for coming. But most important to our panelists uh, for joining uh, Dave, Dana, Beno. Thank you very much. Um,